This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast Season 2. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. Some of the top local and regional anglers in North America. Anglers who consistently finish near the top in both largemouth and smallmouth bass fishing tournaments. Travis and his guest will discuss techniques and strategies used to help these anglers stay so consistent and help you become a better angler and gain an edge on your body of water. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello and welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson, and we got another great guest lined up for everybody today learning what it takes to be a top regional local tournament angler when it comes to both largemouth and smallmouth. We got a smallmouth specialist ready to go. I'm sure he catches a few largemouth here and there, too. We'll ask him. We'll ask him. We'll get to it. But first, before we get into it, let's talk about, of course, The Real Shot. It's my go-to tackle store, therealshot.com. All the top brands that you can think of, Mega Bass, Jackal, Daiwa, Shimano, St. Croix Rods, Kitech, Berkeley, VMC. I don't know. They got it all. Check it out, therealshot.com. You can use my code, smallmouthcrush15, and you'll actually get 15% off your first order. Matt, welcome to the show. Hi, Travis. Thank you for having me. Man, I can't wait to hear all the great information you're going to share when it comes to smallmouth fishing, something I love. You guys know uh, season one was all about the top smallmouth anglers across the country, and you definitely could have fit into that category, but we had to squeeze you into season two, talking about your tournament success and and how well you've done up in that area. I can see a couple of them uh, them trophies everyone's gunning for in the background, so excited to hear some some tournament stories and some different techniques that have that have worked for you along the way but before we get into it if you could just give us a quick introduction uh, about yourself the areas that you fish and and some of the things you have planned for the future certainly so i'm from northwest ohio and a little town called wapakoneta i've been tournament fishing for about 20 21 years maybe uh maybe longer than that um i'm, I'm 45 now i started out in a club fishing just out of college here in the local lima area Lima, Ohio, and I mostly fish for smallmouth up on Lake Erie, and I've been trying to work into St. Clair and really learn that lake as as I progress in, in tournament fishing. So Lake Erie uh, is really where you started? Yes, yeah. Uh, lake Erie and the local lakes here around Ohio, a little okay. bit on the Ohio River. The Ohio River is awful tough. And sure. as you can imagine, you know, you can either go to the river and fish for, you know, little 12 inch largemouth, or you can go to Lake Erie and fish for. Well, who wouldn't want to go to the Ohio River? Come on. Uh, that river's tough. That river's Sign tough. me up. So, Lake Erie, the Detroit River, yeah. Lake St. Clair, you got Lake Huron, you got a little bit of everything to dabble in. Where are you concentrating most of your time nowadays? Nowadays, mostly in St. Clair. Uh, it, the cycle has just been better on St. Clair. That those lakes kind of have gone in uh, bigger fish on Erie a while ago, and now there's seems to be quite a few bigger fish on St. Clair, and I think everybody really knows that. Uh, so I've been trying to learn that and really, really understand how to chase them around that lake. Really learn the St. Clair River as well, uh, and try and expand upon what I can do there. Um, if it gets to Lake Erie, you know, if we have a Detroit River tournament and I can run south. I'll do it. But, uh, but a lot of times we, you know, have our first three BFLs out of St. Clair somewhere and we'll, we'll fish that area of the lake without running all the way down. So you wouldn't really think about running down to Lake Erie nowadays. You would oh, try I've done to, it. I absolutely have. have done it. Yes. Yeah. I fished the North shore a few times running down from Harley Anson. Uh, you can, you can get on a good crankbait bite there in the summer and sometimes later into the early fall. And I've ran down to do that. Crank it for smallies on the Great Lakes. I love it. What's your uh, what's your go-to crankbait for that style on Lake Erie? Uh, usually it's going to be uh, uh, a Strike King uh, 5XD, or it could be um, a Domeki, uh 300 or 200. If you're on St. Clair, I'll throw a lot of the Rapala DT series crankbaits. Mm, we it. cover a lot of the water column with that. Now, Lake St. Clair obviously differs from Lake Erie. But there's probably a lot of similarities, but I would assume there's a lot more different ways you can catch them on St. Clair. Would that assumption be correct? Absolutely. They're two very different lakes. So Lake Erie is all about rock piles, all about little gravel patches, small drops into the channel. I tend to fish Lake Erie very deep, but St. Clair, you can fish from 
right up really shallow in Anchor Bay, all the way out to the center of the lake and fishing 21 feet of water. And you're really looking for, you know, your, your large uh, flats of, of sand grass with, with uh, bald spots in them. And what I like to look for out there, Travis, if you can find it, are little sand ridges. You can find these sand ridges if you're running along at uh, idle speed on a calm or a, or a or a slow speed, 25 miles an hour on a slow on a calm day. You'll see that that uh, fish finder of yours just jump up just a little bit. So if you see that on St. Clair, stop, turn around, and explore it because a lot of times, if you're lucky, you'll find that to be a sand ridge. And those sand ridges can run for a hundred yards. I found one that runs for about a quarter mile. And those can be pretty special on St. Clair. So when you're trying to locate those and you're, you're saying you're running at kind of a faster idle speed or, or maybe on pad even, on pad. are you relying, what, what type of sonar are you relying? Are you, are you 2D or like you're down? 2D while you're running. And if you okay. see anything I'm anywhere on the Great Lakes, if you're running and you see uh, a little blip on the screen, if you're in an area where it's not on the map that there's a contour, you really need to stop, slow down, and take a look at that kind of thing. Figure out what it is. I've found shipwrecks that way and on St. Clair sand ridges, all kinds of fun stuff to fish that way. So what makes these sand ridges so special? I think they're used as travel lines for the smallmouth. So as, as they're moving from one section of the lake to the other, uh, it'd be like a grass edge. Or in St. Clair, they might only be six inches tall. Uh, they'll get on one end and use it to travel to the other end of, of wherever they're going. If you can find, usually it occurs on uh, one end or the other of the ridge where there might be uh, uh, a little higher spot, a turn, that's going to be where they usually stop and, and you can focus on them at that point. Does that change from year to year or is it pretty consistent if you find one? I'm just curious, you know, there's a lot of current maybe grass takes over at some point, maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing. Does that pretty much stay consistent or does that change? It can change. So if grass takes over and covers them up, usually that voids out the, the area. You don't want to stick around. If the grass gets above that little ridge, the fish will move on. What I have found with the current, uh, I think a lot of these are formed and it's set on. it's been said on some of your other shows uh, they're formed by large ice sheets that tend to get tipped up and sink down into the lake. I think what happens is when you find them, if you find them early in their life cycle, they'll be taller. And as they, as the current erodes them down, uh, they can be less pronounced and tend to produce less as time goes on. What depth zone are you talking? Could they be shallow as well as deep? I've got a couple up in uh, 14 foot and all the way out to the center of the lake in 20, 21 foot. Now, what, what would be your approach to target these? Once you we locate uh, a ridge, you know there's fish on it, how are you going to approach that? First thing you'll do is you'll map it out. You'll I like to go and crisscross it the entire length. And as I hit it each time, put a mark on the high spot until I find, say, the, uh, the irregularity. And then I'll put a different color waypoint or maybe a stop sign on the way on that irregularity. So I know... That's where I want to focus. When you come back to fish that, your tournament day, I uh, set up downwind. I like to fish a lot of these with, with uh, drop shots, uh, throw a crankbait over them. St. Clair, if you get some calm weather, throw a spy bait. That's, it's pre- any, any combination of that usually works pretty well. So spy bait, cranks, and drop shotting. Are you going to power fish? Easy. You're going to power fish that first? Or what, what determines if you're going to pick up a, a drop shot over a crankbait? confidence usually it's confidence and i have more confidence on the drop shot than really anything else what's your beta choice or do you have a variety i've got a variety um so i'll throw anything from the z2 uh the trd uh jackal crosstail shads and of course the the gulp series baits as well what would be your favorite pattern if you could choose one on on saint Clair to fish um and technique like if you could just have a fun day of fishing what are you throwing and, and where, where are you targeting these fish? Spy bait. Um, Spy that's, baits. Yeah, actually, that's become one of my favorite ways to fish out there. Uh, they hit that thing pretty hard. And if you can get them on that, they it, it's it's just a fun bite to, to fish. It, it can be fished anywhere from your shallow end of St. Clair up in the St. Clair River and as deep as you want to go. 
A lot of people have a lot of different opinions when it comes to spy baiting and how they fish it and their techniques. I'd like to hear your setup, rod and reel line, as well as your favorite brand. And I'll probably drill you on a few more questions after that about spy baiting. Okay. The rod, I've got a Kistler, old drop shot rod from, from Kistler. It's a, I believe it's a 6.9 Kistler rod, just your medium action for a drop shot. I still use uh, a Stratic reel. I will always throw that on a, on braid. So I use Daiwa Tsunami braid. Then I'll use a pretty long leader uh, Seaguar in, in Bizex, 8 pound or 10 pound leader, just depending on what depth I'm fishing. How do you like that Seaguar? I heard a lot of good things about it. That's my uh, fluorocarbon of choice. Is it? Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I've also used a Seaguar at Brazex, and I've had a little less luck with that. Uh, but the Seaguar in Vizix, uh, man, you can you can tow a boat with that if you want. And I'm learning as I go as well when it comes to uh, different lines and all the products that are out there. But I'm I'm looking in. In fact, this year I'm going to try that a little bit more and. and I always got confused because there's so many different lineups in that in cigars lineup of, of products. That's like, where do you start? But that Invisex sounds, sounds promising. I'm going to uh, definitely try that. So what pound are you going to use uh, with that? Typically 10 pounds. So 10 pound when I'm out in Lake St. Clair, when I'm up in the river and I'm throwing the, a spy bait around and I like to throw the spy bait on flats in the river. I'll go a little heavier. I'll go 12 pound. Uh, with the river current and the way those fish hit it, sometimes on a short line, they'll break you off if you don't have a little heavier line. And then what would be your spy bait brand of choice? Uh, Duo uh, Realis. Mm. So I like to use, I got it right here, this little guy. It's just a shiner color. Uh, it's kind of a brown back and kind of a pearl belly. And it, it, it uh, it's a, the 80 size. So it's the smaller size. I think they can get that in their mouth a little better. Once they're on, they're usually hooked up. Take your time and, and reel them in nice and slow. How does a typical retrieve work with a spy bait for you? Usually, um, I like to throw it out, count down to whatever uh, whatever depth you feel you need to be at. If you're out in 20 foot, maybe you count to 18 and then reel in really slow. And you got to realize that's going to start coming up to you. Uh, so what I like to do is give it a little twitch after about maybe 20 seconds of reeling or, and then reel again, real slow. Let it sometimes let it fall to the bottom and, and keep going. So I'm not always having a constant reel into the, into the boat. I like, I like a little bit of reaction to that lure as it's coming back to the boat. I think that retrieve and having a, a, a visual in your mind of what that bait's doing is really important, especially to keep that in the strike zone the longest. Cause you're right. When you're casting it out there and pendulum back and it's coming up through the water column, it might not be exactly where you want it. it might only be in that strike zone for a little bit of time. If you're just randomly fishing and, you know, not paying attention. I think that's one of the keys to fishing that bait for a lot of guys that haven't used a spy bait. It's a very, efficient way to fish because you can cover a lot of water if you keep it in that depth zone but the biggest thing is you got to throw it around fish to get the confidence in finding those fish it sounds like you have things dialed in when it comes to these sand ridges what, what are some other types of structure that you're going to fish that spy bait around one of the things i've been doing lately is running up into the st Clair river and trying to learn a lot of the current flats up there in the river uh so i've fished that uh, a lot up in the river actually in that four foot of water or less in those, in those current uh, stretches. Uh, it, it just is a good way to really power fish actually the river uh, and cover a little bit more water as you go um, out in the lake. If you can find a, a bald spot within the, within the grass out there, you've got acres and acres and acres of, of sand grass as you get, as you get, get out into that lake. And if you're able to locate an area where you've got, a good bald spot or maybe some sand grass with some large cabbage mixed in get out there and, and just start reeling that really slow and give it a little couple twitches once or twice as you bring it in that'll really trigger the fish so throwing the spy bait a lot of great success with that i want to know what are some some techniques that you want to improve upon or know that will probably work in that zone but you just haven't fished a whole lot that's an easy question for me. One thing I need to work on is uh, swim baits. Um, I have a, a good selection of them. I like to throw your Kitek swim baits. 
uh, but I just don't have enough confidence in them yet so that I that they're the first thing I go to when I get out there. I know they catch them a lot on that up here. I just haven't really haven't really got the confidence in that or even an A rig. I know a lot of people will throw that out there as well, and I just I need to work on that. Um, I know it catches them, and I know I know you can use a swim bait all year long. I just I haven't gotten around to learning the intricacies of that bait. Well, awesome. I got some, I got some questions. Uh, I want to get to, I see a couple of them, uh, first place trophies. I love to, uh, hear a couple stories when it comes to some of your tournament success, but we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the small mouth crush podcast. Don't rush out to the water just yet. We'll be right back after this break. Well, hey, guys, I teamed up with Beast Coast Fishing to design a sneaky little jig that's going to help you catch more fish, whether it be smallmouth, spotted bass, largemouth. This thing, for all you can see this, who are watching this on the YouTube channel, a sneaky little finesse jig, no weed guard, comes in quarter, three-eighths, and half ounce, very thin skirt, right? Not a lot of skirt material. It's designed to emphasize the trailer that you're using. So put your favorite trailer on. I prefer like a TRD, any type of craw, a smallie beaver works great. Z-Man makes a lot of great trailers as well for this jig. I've been throwing a lot this season. I've been catching some amazing fish. Like I am, I am a jig fanatic right now. I'll drop straight down on them over deep water. I'll make cast. I'll, uh, I'll actually drag this as well. Killer little finesse football jig. It's actually the Beast Coast open water sniper jig. Head on over to Beast Coast Fishing dot com and check them out today all right perfect matt great information you know i see some of those trophies in the background love to hear some stories when it comes to uh your tournament success did a lot of those come from from lake erie and and st Clair? uh both of them came from lake erie actually both lake were uh, out of the detroit river in bfls that were that i ran south south and, okay yeah. so uh, both of those um were uh tournaments where i fished pretty deep around uh, north of Pelee, many of the little ridges that drop into the shipping lane or uh, ridges that uh, might be on some of the bigger reef complexes out there. As far as, uh, you know, memorable and how those went, I, I think when it's your time to win, it's just your time to win. One of those in particular, um, as I, I didn't have a chance to practice, but uh, it, it's one of my favorites, favorite areas to run to. And as I was driving up, um, I was speaking to another friend of mine and he says, when you get out there, you're just going to be amazed when you drop your graph in the, uh, in the lake, it's loaded. Of course, we ran out there at the, at the, to the same spot. He got there first. As I was pulling up, he was netting a fish and I set up in the wind there and caught two or three. And you, I'm sure you've seen this, Travis, the smallmouth, they can, once they get pressured, they can tend to sort of short strike it. They'll pull your bait off of your drop shot hook. They were doing that to me, and he was only a few, you know, a few 40 yards away from me or less, and I could see him doing that to him as well. I sat down. I got to fix this. So I changed hooks. Instead of having your, your drop shot hook, your, your gamagatsu split shot drop shot hook, I went to a little different style hook, a rebarb hook, one that I could thread the bait quite a bit farther back, stood back up on the deck, like, I'll fix you, and threw that bait out there, and right away, caught one, caught mm. one caught one and and it was just just about every cast you'd catch one until you really wore the area out and, and you really pull those fish up and off uh it pulled them up and off the the ridge so once they stop biting i run off to another spot pulled up there caught a few more and came back to that that, that same little area started fishing and, and like i said when it's your time to win it's your time to win i i remember that day i i set the hook on one and my reel just broken half and hit the deck and all of a sudden i'm like oh my gosh and right it grabbed my line and actually hand lined hand lined him in big old five pounder brought him right to the boat just like this co-angler scooped him up and there you go it's, it was meant to be when you had when you've seen that particular success by threading that hook on yeah. your drop shot bait i'm asking this because it's it's a it's a way of rigging a drop shot bait that I have not done a whole lot of. Mm -hmm. I've certainly done it, but I haven't done it to the extent that a lot of other guys are because of those short strikes, because of the fact that some baits actually, I think may even fish better 
with that that way of 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 rigging that hook what determines now going back to just nose hooking a bait versus threading it or are you threading a bait more now that you've seen some success on it i typically start out with the standard gamagatsu drop shot hook nose hook it until until i start missing a few of them and then i'll switch over i usually have a, a rod rigged with a, a bait like that sometime it could be a, a, a trd or the z2 uh, something that if, if i start missing a couple i can pick it up real quick and pitch it in there and see if that that's the t- ticket to work I want to talk about those two baits because you mentioned them a couple times now in the podcast. The the TRD and then the uh, Z2. Is it Z2, was it? Yeah, the Z2. The Z2. So Z2, that's a Strike King, right? Yeah. Let's start out with that. What's What makes you uh, pick up that bait? Why do you gravitate towards towards that? Well, um, I think in, in Lake Erie, they like to feed on the Emerald Shiners. Sometimes they're on a Shad Bite or, or Alewives. Uh, and when you've got the... Uh, the, the shiner color in the Z-Mans or the uh, gray glimmer pearl belly, that's, those, that's my favorite color in Lake Erie. Uh, it really imitates that. The biggest thing I think about that bait is it floats. So when the drop shot hits the bottom, the bait just doesn't slump over and go to the bottom. It kind of hangs there in front of them. I think that's really what makes those fish fire on that bait. St. Clair, I'll use the same bait, but I'll switch it over to the it's more of a perch color uh, th- there's a, a green color and a pearl pearl belly that, that I really like in St. Clair. You mentioned the TRD. Yep. I'm assuming you're not, well, I'm sure you Ned rig, but you're actually rigging that on a drop shot as well. Absolutely. Is it wacky rig, nose hooked? How are you fishing that? Uh, usually nose hooked. Um, but again, that's a good one to thread up the hook if you'd like to, uh, because that you can get that hook way to the back of the tail there. And, and if they're nipping at that tail, they'll get it. So patience comes into mind when you're rigging that bait uh, through, you know, a, a Z-Man, a Laztec type of plastic can be a pain sometimes. Do you find that to be the case when you're trying to thread that hook or is it just try to get it as even and, and straight on the hook that you can? Just try to get it as straight as you can so it doesn't twist when it's falling down in the water. They last quite a while, but still, if, if you end up with a bait that won't stay on that barb, Mm-hmm. switch the bait around and hook it from the other side until it's wore out pick up another one so what's the perfect hook to use for that i'm tr- i'm trying to figure it out myself really well i use a robo worm rebarb hook when i when i can find them i've also looked into using the trocar style hook that I, I don't remember the number but it's a you can it's a longer straight shank hook mm-hmm. with uh with the same kind of collar on it and the the difference between the two uh that rebarb has a really small uh, collar that can fit into the, the elastic plastic and stay there. Uh, the uh, the trocar hooks, the collar is just a little larger and it doesn't want to stay within that that uh, elastic plastic as well, but it does work. And your typical setup from your drop shot weight to the hook when you're using this type of floating plastic, does that vary or do you, do you switch it up a little bit when it comes to the length and, and uh, what's your typical length, I guess? Typical is going to be about 16 to 18 inches uh, in the leader length. If you're on St. Clair and you're fishing around grass, you often go quite a bit longer. You could go two or two and a half feet. A lot, you know, when you cast it out there and you've got a, a, a inclination to your line, um, you want to have it above that grass. And if you've only got 16 inches or so, you could be in the grass. Hmm. The, uh, the, the setup would go just a, a standard lead weight. You, I pour a uh, little round ball lead weights and then 16 inches to your hook. And then I have another six or eight inches to a Spro power swivel, little number 10 Spro power swivel. And then I'll have another eight foot of uh, fluorocarbon leader and to, uh, to my main line braid. And that'll just help line twist, I assume. Absolutely. Yeah. So fishing tournaments and, and becoming more familiar, you mentioned areas that you want to explore even further would be the St. Clair and the St. Clair river. Yes. I know, uh, I've had a little bit of experience up there. I, I love that type of fishing. How do you prepare for uh, an event coming up? I usually spend two days before a BFL, uh, in practice. So I'll try to section the lake off. If I, if I want to go to Lake St. Clair, if, if it's out of St. Clair, I, I, and I know I want to stay, I may, um, take a day where I'm going to run, the middle of the lake and the south shore, maybe day two would, depending on wind, 
could be the St. Clair River and the north side of the lake, Anchor Bay, and just kind of hit everything that, um, that fits the pattern for the general time of year that you're that you're there. So do you find when you're practicing for a tournament, are you just going over past history or are you actually trying to look for something new? I mean, there's so much water to cover in two days. What what direction do you go? Past history can get you in a lot of trouble, um, I but it really helps. One thing I do, I, I keep a lot of notes. And the way I keep notes is I'll use my cell phone uh, and dictate notes to myself as I'm driving home from a tournament. So if uh, that week I may have, found them uh, in, in Anchor Bay, or I may have found them out of the main lake. Uh, I'll, I'll just go over the time of year, the conditions, and just where I had found my fish and how I caught them. And then I'll keep that record for years. And as I go up for that event, I'll listen to those, those recordings in my truck as I'm driving. And then I'll start, you know, piecing together the puzzle from there. So if I know that, you know, last year I did pretty good fishing, you know, shallower than normal following the grass out you know I, I might start looking for the grass edge where i had left off last year at that time and then work my way out to to more of my main lake areas like those ridges i described uh where i know they're going to be every year and they tend to show up at the same time every year it's amazing how much you forget i mean you even though you've done it you lived it you fished it you forget that over over a year time and it's like you go back on these notes or even for my case, just being able to film it and watching an old video where it's like, wow, I did that or that happened. It really can get you um, dialed in a lot more quicker, at least give you some ideas and then you can build off of that. But it sounds like you got a pretty good game plan when it when it comes to the Great Lakes. What what are your goals in the future? I mean, do you, do you plan on, are you happy just fishing kind of the local stuff and, and fishing the BFLs? I would really like to to fish a full series of the the Ray of Axe or the Northern Opens if I could. Uh, just time away from work is you know your biggest concern there. Um, I work at a refinery here in Lima. Uh, it, it's pretty demanding and and what I can get off work and and how often I have to be there. So I'm not sure that I can do a full season every year, but one of these years I'll I'll pick a time and do it. So I ask everybody on the show. I'd love to know what your personal best bass is and a little story behind that. I've caught several seven pound largemouth down in Okeechobee. Mm -hmm. um, so, but my, I've caught them. How about smallmouth? Well, we'll get to that. I want to sure. definitely want to know your biggest smallmouth as well. So, in at Okeechobee, well, I want to say all of them have been caught on Senkos, uh, just in different areas of, of the lake. Um, for me, catching a big old seven pound largemouth, you don't get those in Ohio. So, th that's pretty special. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, we go down to Okeechobee about every year, and, and it's just a great time to go down with friends and do that. As far as a smallmouth, I've caught uh, a good number of six-pounders, most of them actually out of St. Clair in the fall. I think my biggest was uh, only a 624, but that's still a pretty big one, mm -hmm. and caught it on a blade bait, a vibe, little gold vibe. Blade bait. We didn't even talk about that. Whew. Killer they're, technique. They're, they're not typically used in tournament season in the great lakes up here um at least i don't use them uh they they tend to attract sheephead if you didn't if you didn't know that if you take them out on lake erie you will catch every sheephead in the lake um and uh, and on st Clair they just catch weeds hmm in the summer months in the summer months yeah. wow but in the fall great bait you can't get away from it it's great what's your blade bait of choice uh, I like to throw a vibe, uh, a little half ounce uh, gold vibe would be my blade bait of choice. I can usually pick them up here at one of the local tackle shops around Indian Lake, local to me. So I asked this question as well with everyone. If I had to give you one bait to use the rest of the season to catch smallmouth, whether it be Lake Erie, St. Clair, that whole region, what would that bait be? It's all you can throw. It's all I can throw. And it's, it's not going to be um, my confidence bait. It's going to be the little Z2 right here, this, Z2. this on, a, on the drop shot, that's going to be my confidence bait every time. So if I were to pick a bait for all year and that's all I can use, that's the one it's going to be. Do they make a couple different sizes or is it just one? Uh, they make a couple. So I do use the smaller size as well. Okay. So this is more of a four inch size. Uh, the other one is like a, like a three inch size or three and a quarter or something. So, but though both of them work very well. Have you used that threading technique with that bait as well? Or is Absolutely. that 
Okay. Absolutely. Oh. And you got to be careful with such a large bait. It'll tend to want to wrap around on your hook and foul as it goes down. But definitely you can use this bait as well to, to thread it up. All right, Matt, really good stuff. A lot of great information. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show today. How can people follow you? Keep track of what you what you got going on out there. Well, I've got a Facebook page, just my name, Matt Elkins. I do have uh, a YouTube channel, um, Matt Elkins Fishing. Um, I don't post a whole lot, but occasionally I do. I'd like to do a little more of that. Um, I also have an Instagram and a Twitter account. I'm not very active on Twitter, but um, Instagram uh, definitely under Matt Elkins Fishing. Oh, cool. And we'll actually put all those links in the description below uh, for this video as well. So as far as sponsors, I uh, really don't have a whole lot, any sponsors. Um, I do go over to a friend of mine uh, every once in a while, uh, uh, BJ Baxter. He has LBA baits and will work on pouring up different colors of plastics for drop shots. Uh, and that's always fun to do. I'm working on uh, pouring up a few different uh, uh, swim baits with him. He hand pours the swim baits. And I just... Oh very much like a Kytec. So a lot of times I'll get those from him and, and try them out as I, as I go forward learning the swim bait process. Really appreciate you coming on and you're always welcome back. This was some great information. All right. Thank you very much, Travis. Awesome. And as always guys, until next time, we'll see you on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.